Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guests today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Leah Matthews and Julie Mitchell. How y'all doing, ladies? Hey, good morning. Hi, How guys. are you? I'm doing wonderful. How was y'all weekend? Long good. weekend. How about you? It was good. I hope yours was good, too. Nope, still looking for another day. Still looking for one more day off, but uh, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're back at it with another episode of Chief Chat with an awesome guest. But before we get started, I want to give a shout out to Maurice Matsumuri. Uh, he's uh, the the host of podcast called Stoke Meter. And he had me on the show to kind of talk about my career and, and then talk about the awesome work the exchange does for our service members and their families. And then he extended his olive branch to bring on one of his personal friends as a guest. And man, we have that guest today. So without further ado, Julie, please introduce him. So today's guest has had film roles in In the Valley of Allah, Cloverfield, and Savages. And But you probably best know him for his role in the TV series Quantico. But before he hit it big, he served his country in the Army for four years in the 3rd Infantry Division, which was the first unit to enter Baghdad back in 2003. We are thrilled to have him here with us today, and please help us give a warm chief chat welcome to Jake McLaughlin. Hey. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> we, got, we got to introduce you the right way, Jake. Yeah, quite the introduction. Wow, I feel like I'm <laughs> on the Tonight Show. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Well, welcome, Jake, and everybody watching. Drop a note in the comments. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, you can leave your questions there, too, and we'll read those live. Chief Chats are every week, and we have terrific guests lined up for you this fall, so we want you to turn on your notifications so you don't miss anything. Awesome. So, Jake, man, it's great to have you with us today. Hey. No, I appreciate you guys having me. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. It's awesome. And then I see your cat is over there pretty busy, too. He's over there beating up the couch. Oh, man. Yeah, he's tearing <laughs> everything up right now. It's just like, my, yeah, I was telling you before I got on that my dad found a cat in the bushes and then brought it up here and gave it to my daughters as a, as a present. So we're stuck with this <laughs> feral cat running around the house. So whatever. I don't know. <laughs> Not a hill I was going to die on. Exactly. So how how... How have you and your family been doing during, during the pandemic? Great. Yeah, everything's been really good here. Um, we haven't, uh, it hasn't been really bad here in Idaho so much as far as uh, just, you know, with, with mandates and things like that. You know, we had them at first when the, uh, when all the mask mandates came out and, uh, and it was only for a few months. And then, you know, I, don't, I just don't think people really went out very much. And, and, you know, we've done pretty well here in Idaho. The schools, you know, they, they gave the parents the option to uh, they suggested they they wanted to put give make the kids wear masks, but the parents didn't really want it. So they said, okay, well, the parents get to decide. Uh, you get to fill out an opt out form. So they're giving. You know, it's it's been great. We got COVID back in uh, December. Uh, my whole family did. All of us kids. My dad brought it up actually from California and then gave it to us. And so we all got it all at once, thankfully. So we didn't have to keep you know leapfrogging with the quarantining like a lot of my neighbors had to do. And so. So yeah, I mean everything's been pretty pretty mellow here where I'm at. Yeah. Well, it sounds like Dad's bringing a whole bunch of stuff from California, man. Just <laughs> yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah. You know, what's next? I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, we'd like to learn a little bit more about your time in the military. Could you talk to us about your time in the army and what led you to joining? Yeah. Um, well, what led me to joining was uh, I was a security guard at Universal Studios. I was 18 years old and uh, I was working up there. And uh, that's when September 11th happened. And basically that the day and I had to go into work that day. Obviously, I got called in early and had a pretty long shift up there checking the buildings for bombs. And, you know, it was kind of a crazy, hectic time. And uh, and yeah, so I that September 11th happened. The next day I went down to the recruiter's office and got my paperwork started to uh, to go join the infantry. Um, and that's basically what I did. I kind of continued to work while I was in processing and going through the whole MEPS process and then uh, went in 
uh, signed up in uh, signed up. I well, started signing up on September twelfth, two thousand one, and then ended up going into basic January of two thousand two. So uh, yeah, and then I, I went in and got stationed at Fort Stewart, Georgia, and then we were on a regular I eight rotation to Kuwait uh, already when we uh, made the push into Baghdad. So we uh, we staged out there, and we yeah we went through Baghdad, uh, uh, Fallujah, Nasiriyah, Karbala, all those places all part of our our push on the thunder run on the push in there and then yeah that's uh that was i was a saw gunner on a on the on a out of this is my unit's crest actually we had a bunch of shirts made from uh from a uh, grunt style if you order like 50 or more you can get your own you know logos put on so this was the the can do crest from my unit and i even have a cup that my buddy just sent to me that he had made with my name on it that's so awesome. cool oh <laughs> yeah yeah, we just had a conversation with uh with Gary Sinise, and he talked about September 11th being the reason, like kind of why he kind of started his his uh, Gary Sinise Foundation and and things of that nature. And then so we start talking about uh you know service members that decided to join right after September 11th. So that's that's kind of cool yeah. that you kind of uh you know kind of harp that that point uh of how how that day changed so many lives. Um, oh, big! And, I, and you know, the funny thing was, I wasn't unique in any way because or I tried to sign up to go in right away, but I got put on a delayed entry program because they were too uh, they were too backed up with people signing up to even be able to process that many people through into you know into basic into basic training. So I had to wait for that many people because it was it was it was a kind of a pandemic of its own of its own sorts of people joining the military afterwards. Yeah, that's so, awesome. Yeah, it was, it was a really neat time, really. Well, not a good time, but a neat time as far as, you know, the uni unification of really kind of the world at that time, if you remember it, you know. It was oh, pretty, yeah. The whole world was, I guess it was pretty neat. That was, that was, was the equation, you know. The rest of it wasn't too, too pretty, but it is what it is. Well, thank you for your service, Jake. Uh, understand that your military experience actually uh, helped you land your first movie role. So can you share with us um, how you first got into acting? Yeah, um, so when I was living in Los Angeles, when I was a security guard, my next door neighbor was, uh, uh, his name is Brendan Wayne. He's, he's uh, John Wayne's grandson. And he actually does uh, the stand-in work uh, and the, oh, the wow. beveling for the Mandalorian. I'm sure the Mandalorian now. He's a really good, really great guy. And him and his wife used to send me packages actually when I was in Iraq, and uh, just good, just salt of the earth kind of people. And his wife was an assistant to a casting director, Sarah Finn, who casts you know all the Marvel movies, all the Sarah Finn and Randy Hiller. They cast all the Marvel, Terminator, you know, anything big. They cast it, Star Wars, all that stuff, and. Uh, they were looking to cast actual combat vets in a role. So she was driving around Los Angeles trying to round up actual combat vets that had been to Iraq and Afghanistan. And, uh, and so I wanted them to audition for the movie because Paul Haggis, the director of the film, wanted to audition the, the, you know, the people that had actually been there to see how they did. Uh, and he, I guess he wanted to bring kind of an authenticity to the role. So I was up in Northern California pouring concrete when my wife got the call from Sarah to come down and have me audition for the role. And I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I don't, I didn't, you know, I didn't know what sides were, which is like a little script that they, piece of the script they give you to audition with and whatnot. And I had to fly down there. There was no such thing as the Zoom, you know, Skype. There was none of that stuff. Back yeah. Then. So I had to actually fly down to LA to audition for um, this role. She said I could audition for two different roles. If, uh, well, I could pick one of these two roles. And so I picked the role that I wanted to audition for. And I went down there and I brought a bunch of stuff that I had from my rack, like pictures, I had albums. And I had a, I have a, a little medal, a silver medal, an Olympic silver medal with Saddam's face imprinted on it um, from his palace that I got. And I brought that down there. They wanted me to bring stuff with them. And the casting directors wanted to pick my brain as well about like military stuff, you know, like what age would you be through this rank? What does this do? What does that do? Kind of stuff. And, Ask me questions about the script. And so they, I went down and I was broke. I was trying to sell my truck to pay the rent because my wife had just had my son and we were flat out and just broke. And uh, I auditioned and then they asked me if I'd stay afterwards, if they could pick my brain and if I'd also come back on that Monday, this is on a Friday, to audition for Paul and the producers. And I said, yeah, of course. But I had I was supposed to fly back Saturday to go to work on Monday. So I called my boss and asked if I could have Monday off. And he said, yeah. And uh, 
So I went back in on Monday and auditioned for the role. And I see, you know, I saw James Franco walking out as I'm walking in, and I'm going, oh crap, I'm not going to get this. This is like, yeah. I'm just going out for this thing. So, but I, luckily, I don't think he was going out for the role that I was going out for. So that was that was nice. Uh, but yeah, it was just kind of a, a little bit of a nerve wracking experience. But uh, I auditioned for it, and I. Uh, I flew back home and went back to work because it was this was October, so it was kind of the concrete season was kind of dying down from all the rain and whatnot. And so uh, I just got my truck driving license so I could drive trucks in the off season. And uh, I get a call from the casting director, Sarah Finn, and my buddy's uh, wife, Brendan Wayne's wife's name, Sarah Harrington, my friend. And uh, I get a call from Sarah, Sarah Finn, the casting director, and it was nighttime. And I say, and I say hello. And she says, hey, Jake, it's Sarah Finn. I just wanted to call and say thanks for coming down and auditioning. You know, you, you, had a, you did a great job, and you should really get into acting. You have a, you know, you can take some classes, and you have a knack for it, and come down here and do this stuff. But, you know, the odds of you getting this role were astronomical. You weren't, you weren't, you weren't likely to get the role in the first place just because, you know, you know. You, you, you know, you know all the people that were going out for it and whatnot. And I said, "Oh no, I appreciate it, Sarah. I really, uh, I'm really, you know, I really appreciate you bringing me down and uh, and you uh, know, give me a chance to, to you know audition for this movie. I can tell my grandkids someday that I auditioned for a major motion picture. That's really, really cool, you know. And I had already known that Tom Lee Jones and Charlie Theron were casting the movie, so the whole time, this whole like four or five days that were transpiring that passed by, where I was just there going, "Oh man, what if? What if I?" You know, got a role in this movie. This would be crazy. It'd be life changing because I had to change my flight for that Monday. It left me with ten dollars in my bank account. So I really doubled down on that, on a lot at that time. And uh, and so she's telling me all this, and I tell her thank you for all this stuff. And then Sarah, Sarah, Sarah Finn just says, "Oh, you got the part." And I said, "What?" She goes, "Congratulations, Jake. You got the part." And then I hear my friend Sarah Arrington and Brandy Heller start laughing on the other line. They were listening in on the phone call, and I go, "Are you serious?" And she's, she goes, "Yes, Jake. Congratulations." And I'm like, "What? Are you serious? I love you. I'm like, I, I love you guys." I start freaking out, going crazy, and, all this stuff. and I, I don't know what the hell to say, honestly. I don't know exactly what I said, but I know I said I love you to, to them a few times, and uh, and then I ran out to the living room, and oh, whoops, sorry, that was my kid's uh, dinosaur phone ringtone. Sorry about that. Uh, um, I ran out to the living room. My wife was on the phone with her mom at the time, and I go, Stephanie, I, I got the part. And, and she just drops the phone right then and there and starts crying, and I start crying like a baby and just start, you know, it was just such a really cool moment for me that that happened. And then, you know, I started, I got on that, I did that movie, and James Franco was in the movie, and he's, you know, from Palo Alto. He's kind of, a, he's a NorCal boy too, like me, and him and I got along real well, and he hooked me up with his manager, actually, who in turn sent me out to meet with agents, and then, you know, and then I moved, I would move down from uh, Chico. I left my wife and the kids up in Chico while I moved down and stayed with my aunt and uncle and did uh, construction work down there while I went on auditions and started trying to give acting a, a shot <laughs> and really kind of cut cut my teeth on a few acting classes with Janet Alhanti. She just passed away this last year, but um, she was a great, great teacher. I didn't go to a ton of classes, but what I did go to were great. And uh, I got a boss that let me go to auditions whenever I had it, but I just had to go back to work afterwards. So there were times when I'd be going out for like a lawyer audition and I'd be covered in paint and concrete and whatever else. And I'd go into the audition, there'd be everybody else, all these good looking dudes, you know, in suits and whatnot and looking all clean cut and sharp. And I'm covered in, you know, paint and concrete. And <laughs> I didn't have time to change. So it was, that was kind of like my, that was kind of my life for a couple of years of really kind of getting my foot in the door. It was a lot of work. So, so how, how'd your army buddies, uh, uh, react to you being, I guess, a movie star or whatever the case may be. You know, they're actually the ones that are the most supportive of anybody in all honesty. There's nothing pretentious about any of those guys. So they're just, you know, they break your balls about it. You know, like when we're out, when we'll be out, like a bunch of them came out and surprised me for Veterans Day when I was working on Quantico in, uh, in New York. And it was a really emotional time. It was really cool that they came out and did that. And we went to the UFC fight, you know, the McGregor fight and whatnot. Uh, and one of them actually punctured my eardrum uh on accident which was, that was pretty fun uh but anyway no they were they've been the most they've been the most, they've been the most supportive uh out of anybody they really have they break your balls you'll be yeah we'll be out in new york and people will come up and 
they'll they'll notice that somebody recognizes me from the show, you know, or whatever's going on, and they'll go out of their way to just go, hey, do you you, you know you, you recognize him? And like they'll you know just go over and get do the picture thing. So they just they like to give me a hard time that way, but it doesn't bother me. I just think it's it's funny. They're 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 pretty funny. Yeah, they've been yeah. they've been great. Absolutely. Yeah, they've been the, they've been the best. And leave it to your friends to burst bur- your eardrum. So, yeah, it, it, it's uh, always your friends, right? <laughs> that was actually a funny story. You want to hear it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry, if it takes up time, but they, uh, it's a funny story, so it's worth telling. We were we were out drinking, and um, we were with my buddy, my platoon sergeant, Sergeant Molina, is from, from New York. So he wanted to take us down to Times Square, which was near where my apartment was, to go get some hot dogs from the street vendors. So we go down there, my buddy O'Neill, who I've mentioned his show on every – every TV series I've ever done. He's been on half the shows I've been on because he comes to visit me, which is pretty funny. But he got a chicken shish kebab skewer with the wood thing on it. And we're walking, kind of stumbling, the whole group of us down the sidewalk uh, towards my apartment. And I feel this bug on my ear. So I kind of turn my head to like do that and smack it away. And uh, and it wasn't a bug. It was him screwing with me because he was drunk and putting the, sh- the shish kebab skewer up to my ear. And so when I turned my head, it went into my eardrum and punctured my eardrum. It was nasty. I had, you know, clear fluid coming out of my ear, blood. I had the whole thing. It was bad. And I instantly felt like my tires went flat. Like I couldn't walk in a straight line. My equilibrium just instantly went really weird. And so I started walking. I'm holding my ear down. And I'm cussing him out. And they're, they're telling me I'm being a bitch about it and whatnot, <laughs> as they would. And, uh, and so I'm just walking and I'm kind of just stumbling and I keep bumping into this guy and I think it's one of my buddies and I keep bumping into him and bumping into him. And I hear my buddy O'Neill go, Hey dude, stop bumping into that guy. And I don't even look up at him. And I, I'm just like, Hey man, I'm sorry, dude. I, this guy punctured my eardrum and I, I can't walk straight. I mean, you know, and he's like, Oh no, I'm, it's okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I hope you're okay. And he's like really polite about it. You know, really nice, like being really nice about it. And we keep walking and I keep, I'm walking next to the guy still because I guess we were just walking at the same pace. And I bump into him again and kind of like push him over to the side pretty far. And then I go, dude, I'm, so, I'm sorry, man. And, I, and I, I look up at him and I have to keep looking up. He's six foot eight. And I look at this dude and I'm going, oh, my God. And, of course, it was because we were just leaving from where the like UFC press conference stuff was. It was Travis Brown, the UFC heavyweight. Oh, no. And it's his girlfriend at the time. And it's Ronda Rousey. So it was Travis Brown that I'm sitting there bumping into with, you know, <laughs> you know, blood and fluid coming out of my ear like a moron. And then there's Ronda Rousey next to him with one of her friends. And she recognized me from Quantico. And, of course, I knew who Travis Brown and Ronda Rousey are because that's, that's, I watch UFC. You know, I watch every UFC fight. So uh, it was a pretty funny moment. We got pictures with them. And they were, they, you know, they were all just extremely polite and just really cool. It was, it was, uh, it was a neat little side uh side thing that happened as a result you know from getting my eardrum punctured so <laughs> again absolutely you got pictures so, uh, of them with your bloody ear drum that's no, awesome I have, I, I, you can't see the blood in my ear but i have a picture of that of them with me with them it's somewhere on one of my phones it's, it's uh it's just me with like you know like this but kind of smiling but kind of in the same time kind of in a lot of pain and <laughs> smiling through <laughs> Yeah, there's, listen, there's, there's plenty of stories like that um, throughout the military on, on Friday, Saturday night. So uh, a, lot, a lot of them don't yeah, make it to the air. Only 14 million people in New York City, you know, might as well just yeah, bump, yeah. bump into the you know, heavyweight, you know, light heavy or heavyweight, you know, UFC fighter. That's a, what are the odds of that? <laughs> yeah. So, so I know your time in the army kind of brought really kind of authenticity to the military roles. But, uh, but as everybody knows, man, we learned so many uh, qualities and characteristics while we're serving. So what, how did that influence your, your non-military roles being in the military? Well, I think the, I think that what it does is because like I, everyone asks me like what the best, best thing to do about like learning how to act and stuff is. And I don't really know because you, it's just kind of always, it's just an ongoing process is kind of really the way it works. But I think that just the life experience of, just having life experiences, getting out and doing things and experiencing life and seeing different places, being around different people or being in different scenarios and all that stuff. That's really where you get the tools to, to be able to draw from. If you have a scene that pops up and like, Oh wait, I can relate to that in this way, or I can relate to that in this way. And I think that just, you know, you know, being in the military, just the, the amount of experiences that you have 
uh, are, are incredible. Not just, you know, cause you're in the military and you're off doing, you know, some different things, but I mean, there's, you, you're going to so many different places. You're with so many different people from different walks of life being thrown into this washing machine together. And you otherwise wouldn't be exposed to that different, that kind of, uh, you know, I guess, I guess diversity, I guess is probably the best way to, to put it otherwise, because when you, it's funny when you're in the military and you go out with your buddies and you're, you go to you see them for the first time in their civilian clothes because you're so used to seeing them in their in their uh you know whatever they're wearing now BDUs DCUs ACUs whatever whatever the hell it is now I can't I don't even I can't keep up with it all but uh, when you all get together to go out and go drinking for the first time and you go get in your one buddy that has a car's car and you head down to down in, down in the town to go drinking and you get to see how everybody dresses and how much different everybody looks you got one guy in a cowboy hat over here with shit kickers on you got another guy with his pants hanging off his ass you got another guy that's you know wearing a wife beater with a choker and you know studded belt you're like what the hell what the hell, where the hell did this come from you're like how did, I, how did i end up here and it's just and they end up being the best guys in the world you know and you and you and they become your brothers very quickly especially after going to you know combat with them so it's just it's just funnier than hell to see how just the different walks of life in the military when you're all going out and you always know they're military because none of them are ever look none of them ever look the same they're all dressed you know however the hell they dress from wherever they're from <laughs> and they're in packs of eight too for whatever reason it's, yeah. it's like a pack of eight <laughs> a squad size element no less yeah exactly <laughs> Jake, during your time in the Army, I'm sure you spent some time with the PX. Can you maybe talk about a time that the exchange or the, the PX, as Army folks like to call it, uh, was there for you? Yeah, uh, yeah, there was. There was uh, the, one, the, the time that really stood out the most to me was when we went to, uh, to Kuwait. Uh, we didn't really have anything when we first got over there because it was just kind of this cabal. We were in this place called Camp New York, and it was just a cabal that was just kind of a – a makeshift base and we didn't really have anything. There was no real food places. We had the MWR tent, which was basically like a ping pong table. So we didn't have a whole lot going on. And then the PX would have the, they would get their shipment in. I think it was once a week or once a month. And we'd come in, we'd, we'd go line up to go get what we wanted to go get. And I, I mean, it looked like an old Popeye cartoon where, you know, Alibaba and the 40 thieves come through and just take everything off the walls. And it's just not even the copper wires are left. You know, it's just, it, we stripped everything dry, even stuff you didn't need, but you could just have money sitting in the bank from not being able to spend it because you're in Kuwait. So you just go blow your money on stupid crap you don't need. And uh, one of the uh, one of the things that one of the guys bought was a the the DVD for Band of Brothers. The box set DVD had just come out. And my buddy John Doyle from uh, from Philadelphia he bought it, and we had this little uh, pop up DVD player that you could put the DVD in, and it had maybe like a maybe a six inch screen on it and we had our entire platoon and our off time on Sundays for a couple hours we would take took it and we'd watch as many episodes of Band of Brothers as we could and we really you know we all loved watching it and, and doing it and then years later here, here I go and I did this show called Crash and I was roommates with Ross McCall who ended up, who was in Band of Brothers uh who played lead guy in Matt Band of Brothers so and he's a good friend of mine so uh it was just kind of one of those small world stories that came about. That was that was pretty cool, you know. With the that's the one that stands out the most with the PX with me. Thanks for sharing that, Jake. Uh, we love to hear yeah. stories about um, how so soldiers and airmen and what they do when they go to the PX. So um, thanks for sharing <laughs> that. <laughs> and as you know, we have soldiers, airmen, guardians, sailors, Marines, and Coast Guard members from around the world. They're joining us live today. So are, do you have any words of inspiration or hope that you can share with the military community? Yeah, just uh, just know that you're doing the right thing. You know, you're serving your country, and there's a lot to be proud of just from doing that. You're already part of the minority in the country that are that actually, you know, served. So even when you get out or if you decide to make a career of doing it, you know, you've already done the things that most people aren't even willing to do. So there's nothing that can even stop you from, you know, from accomplishing anything that you want to go from where, whether you, you know, once you get out of your military career or if you decide to stay in with your military career and don't get complacent. That's the other thing. That was the main yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's great advice. Great advice. I, uh, I, I had to, I, so I was I started off in the Marine Corps. So uh, that, I did four years in the Marine Corps. I got out and uh, 
complacency was I, I went straight into complacency. So I went back to mom's house. I'm sleeping on the couch. I'm doing the same stuff I was doing when I was 18 or 17 before I joined. And I had to kind of snap at, snap out of it. And I needed to come back in the military to, to kind of get, yeah. get back out of that funk or whatever the case may be. So uh, complacency, that, that was a... No, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. A little bit of a delay. No, no, no. I think there's a little bit of a delay. No, it's it, it's it's a it's a crazy thing. And what like what I meant by what I mean by that now is like because I've been you know I got into acting and I've gotten to go do like the you know the red carpet things and all that glit you know the glitzy glamoury kind of stuff. But um, when I came back from Iraq and uh, we landed in Savannah, we took the buses to come into Fort Stewart, and we ended up in this this uh, little track behind it's what where now the warriors walk is where all the trees are planted with the soldiers we lost in Iraq and Afghanistan are, are now. And it was a, it's a track and we parked the buses there and it was just a row of, uh, of uh, pine trees. And we had to wear whatever our, the nicest pair of DCUs that we had at the time were, cause we're coming back. So we're all looked like crap anyway. Um, and everyone's family, my family wasn't there, but everyone's family was there. Cause it was too, you know, we were, I was all the way over on the other side of the country in California. There was thousand, two thousand people at least in this in these stands. And it felt like we were at the Olympics. We walked out and broke the lines of form, in the ranks of the formation and made a wider formation walking forward. And the band was playing and the cameras were going off. It was the craziest thing. And I've said to myself, I just don't think that there's ever been there'll ever be a moment that really makes me feel that proud or that uh, that you know that it made me. It was the best feeling I think I've ever had in my life. That that feeling of just accomplishment and appreciation that everybody had. It was just a really an amazing thing. And, uh, and so that's what I mean by, you know, that you can, you really can do anything that you want once you get out. It just really goes to show you that and again, it's, and what you're doing right now is extremely important and it can be the, it'll be the best time of your life. You'll look back on it and you'll think, wow, that as much as it sucked, it really ended up being the best time of my life. And it was, you know, it can, it can suck or it can be great or it can be whatever. But even when people, even people that, you know, hated their time, hated being in the military, still look back on it and think that was the, that was the best time of my life. You know, you know how it goes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, we're going to kind of switch gears back to um, COVID and how it affected uh, making movies. So uh, I'm sure, I'm sure you had it, uh, you had your experience before and now how has COVID kind of shaped uh, your, the, the movie making process for you? It's been rough. It's been real rough for actors, you know, cause uh, you, we, we uh, you know, first of all, there's nothing, there was nothing being shot. So when I got done doing Quantico, I wanted to take a year off just to be with my family because I had missed so much. I was gone filming so much 10 months out of the year for that show, you know, hours and hours and hours a day. And, uh, and so I want to take a year off. So I took a year off. And then right when I was getting ready to go back to work, I had to go in and have two back surgeries, you know, within months of each other. And so that took another, you know, eight months or so out of my, out of my, uh, you know, being my ability to go back to work. And then COVID hit. My, in fact, my surge, my second back surgery, I got the day that they, the day before they cut off elective surgeries because of COVID. So then the lockdown happened and all that happened. Movie industry shut down. So it's effectively been a really rough two years, two and a half, three years for me, really, as far as getting work. And then another thing is that um, with the with the Screen Actors Guild, they don't count residuals as income. So the move money that you make off of the sales of movies or DVD sales or online purchases and stuff that you normally get, SAG doesn't count that towards income for the year, which can be sometimes fairly fairly decent or significant. Uh, and so because nobody was working, the way that the health insurance uh, for Screen Actors Guild works is it works in quarters and periods. And so nobody was working. So there was effectively, I think so I heard 12,000 actors without that completely lost their health insurance and stuff like that. So there was a lot of that's a pretty rough. That was a pretty rough one, you know, to to take that hit because we've been paying into it for so long, you know, for the stuff. You're like, wait a second. I thought I was, you guys are supposed to be looking out for us. This is what this kind of stuff's for. You know, you're like, but. I don't know. Guess not. <laughs> and they eventually they came up with a different program that was a bit more, you know, reasonable. Uh, but it was a little bit too little, too late is really what happened. Uh, so yeah, it's really just and now it's kind of back on the upswing of things going on. It did a lot of things that were kind of good for the for the uh, TV industry because it put so many butts in seats at home watching TV. You know, for during COVID, people were sitting around watching watching tv with their families and stuff a lot of a lot of parents were forced to actually spend time with their kids and <laughs> 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 yeah 
That's true. Very true. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's been it's been pretty bad. It's been pretty. And then and then like so, uh, I did this project this uh, this summer uh, in Louisiana, and I had to test every single day for COVID, even on my days off. I wasn't allowed to start working until my results came back. And you, you know, you had to wear a mask everywhere, everywhere, and everywhere you went, anywhere you went, all the, everywhere you went, except for right when you were you know not doing the scene, you take the mask off and then. You, then you start filming, but every day you got to go and do this, the nasal swab test and do that. That made it a, even on your days off, it made it a bit of a pain in the ass. I'll be honest with you. It was, it was, Oh yeah. Pretty I can imagine. Actors. That was every single crew member. Oh. So, yeah. Pretty, yeah. <laughs> so it's affected the film industry pretty, pretty, pretty big time. So you've been acting for um, for several years. It, is there a, a favorite role you have, and why? Um, I mean, I always have an affinity for the first role I ever played, just because there was so many different new. It was such a new experience for me, and it was such a neat uh, time in my life. It was such a kind of it was really magical, actually, for me. Um, but no, I, I really like the characters where I get to play a character that's completely different from me. I did this. I did this episode of The Mentalist, and I played this like you know, ghetto talking UFC fighter. And I thought that that was like, not a great, uh, not a great, uh, I guess, I don't know what, what you would say, like, uh, you know, way to, way to, uh, way to portray <laughs> UFC fighters. They probably didn't like it very much for some of them didn't, but it was a fun role to play because it was so over the top that it was ridiculous. And, and that was fun. Um, yeah. And I mean, like, yeah, I just, I, I have fun with every role that I, that I, that I do. I do have a lot of fun. It's just a fun job when you're actually, when you actually get to work, you actually, it's a lot of fun for me. So I don't really have like a favorite. I just having a, I try to do something different with every single one and each one has its, its new challenges and different things, you know, that are going on. I usually, I usually get my ass kicked though. That's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, was, I was checking out your Instagram page and you had a couple pictures on there where you had a black eye and, so, oh yeah, and it, and it looked like it was for real. It didn't look like it was some makeup or anything. Like like you was, you some something went on uh, during during a scene, and uh, you you caught you caught a couple of them to the head. Caught a caught a tire iron to the face. It was uh, that was uh, Quantico. That was Tim Murphy beat the hell out of me at the end of the at the end of the uh, episode. At the end of the at the actually at the end of the the, the show the whole show. And, uh, and yeah, that lady did. She did a fantastic job on the makeup. It was pretty gnarly. Was, and the best thing about those scenes, though, is you know when you get when you get the hell beat out of you like that, then you know the next scene's your coma scene, and those are the best scenes to do as an actor. You can just go to bed. <laughs> the more, the more asleep you are, because you're always you're always trying to catch up on sleep wherever you can. So when you get a scene where you're supposed to be asleep, you're like, yes, let me go get into character here for this one. I'll go, I'll go pass out for real. I've passed out a few. I passed out before I started snoring <laughs> in the middle of the scene. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, can you tell us uh, what's ahead for you? You got any projects on the horizon you can share? Yeah. Um, so, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the name of the uh, of the one that I just that I'm doing right now. It's for Apple TV, and I think they're slated to come out. It's slated to come out in January, and it was called. They changed the name of it, but it was called um, "In with the Devil." And it's based on a true story, and it has uh, Paul Walter Hauser's in it, uh, Greg Kinnear, Joel uh, Joel Edgerton's in it. Um, it it's got a really uh, – Gray Liotta's in it. It's got a really cool cast, and it's based on a true story about a serial killer, and it's a, it's a, uh, it's a limited series, sort of like, um, uh, you know, The Night Of or True Detective. And that, it's in that vein. I think it's four episodes. And uh, then you should check it out because everything that I saw from what I, what I saw out there and the scenes that we had were at, it was absolutely fantastic. And Dennis Lehane wrote it, who did uh, Shutter Island. He did that film, The Drop. Um, it's gonna, it's it's real, really cool crew, really cool cast, and it's, it'll be fun. And then I'm uh, gonna start here. I think next week or in a week and a half, I'm heading out to uh, to go film a movie called Homestead uh, with Lev and Rambin. And they have a couple other people in talks to play a few of the other roles. And uh, so that should be pretty fun. So it's uh, only like a month shoot and it's a little indie film that I'm going to shoot. And I think it'll, it's a cool script though. So it'll, uh, I think it's going to be pretty good. And, uh, and then I have that movie home. I did that a couple of years ago, uh, but it's, you know, because of COVID and trying to find, you know, distributors, it's been, it's been hard. So that's with Kathy Bates and, uh, 
uh, Lil Rel, Howery, and uh, Stephen Roots, and it's got a it's got a neat cast. It's a good story, and Franco Patente directed it, and it was really fan. It was really good. And Kathy, Kathy was that was a that was a nice wake up call after being out of the acting game for a year and a half, and then your first movie back, and you're acting as you know Kathy Bates' son in a film. That's not nerve wracking at all. Jesus. <laughs> oh yeah. Let me just fall into the groove of this thing again. Let me just see. Let me just see what's going on. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it was great because she's so good. It like it made it so easy for me to just fall right back into just being comfortable and uh, and really free to explore. You know, the scenes and do the scenes that we were doing, and they, and we had some really cool stuff come out of it. It was, it was cool. It was really fun. Yeah, and I know before we were uh, before we went live, we were talking about all these horror films. So, what's what's your favorite genre of of, of movies? Uh, my favorite genre is uh, probably I'm gonna say 80s sci-fi would be my favorite. Yeah, 80s, 90s. I like the 80s. I like 80s, 90s sci-fi. I, I mean, that, it's it's hard to say that any any specific genre just because uh, I love all movies of all different eras. I, I I'm a pretty big movie buff. Um, but there's a documentary coming out called uh, I think it's called the Search for Tomorrow, and it's a documentary series about. Um, all 80 sci-fi movies and each episode i think takes place like one episode will be 1980 one episode will be 1981 and it just covers movies and tv shows that they're uh, that are were sci-fi like pop pop culture you know uh movie genre like back to the future highlander you know that kind of stuff all the all that stuff aliens and they're going to cover it extensively in each episode and i can't i'm dying for that to come out i can't wait i actually yeah. have a pack of guys of mine, we have a pact not to watch it until we're all together, so we can all watch it together. We, we're gonna, we're gonna nerd out a little bit. <laughs> now I'm gonna, I'm gonna check that out too because I like I like that I like that genre as well. I like the eighty sci fi. Uh, yeah, I mean I love Terminator too. I, I mean like I, I you know like I love True Romance is one of my favorite movies, which was written by Quentin Tarantino. Actually, I, I, I thought it was fantastic. I love you know, Terminator two. I love Jurassic Park. I like. Uh, you know, state of grace, those kind of, I like those kind of movies. I, I don't know. They're, they're all over the place. I just, I love, I love movies and film, television. It's, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Fantastic. Looking forward to checking out some of your new roles, Jake. Um, so we want to pause for just a second and take a look at the comments um, from our, our live Facebook feed. So Lori McKinley uh, says, good morning from a mom of a Marine in Southern California. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Carla says, hua. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what this is about. It says, good night. Um, I think it was when you were talking about the night that your eardrum got <laughs> um, burst or whatever. Oh, oh. <laughs> um okay so carla also says well said don't get complacent in anything so that's great advice for everybody and then there's a couple people saying hi from chiefs page two let me go um janice says hello from colorado springs and then tori yes. says i watched that show it was cool to learn that he was a veteran oh well thank you yeah. You go. You have a lot of fans out there today. Yeah. It's, it's so it, 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 that, no, thank you guys. Thanks for thanks for listening to it too. It's it's uh it's been a while since I've had this since I've done a, an actual podcast, but it's it's like auditions now are all done through the Zoom thing, so it's a weird process because it's like every audition is almost like you're in a teleconference, you know. Every, oh, every it's, it's a weird <laughs> weird new thing to try to learn how to do. You mentioned all of the new projects that you're working on. Is there some place where our viewers can go to kind of keep up with you? Do you have a website or any social channels we can follow along on? The only thing I have is uh, um, Instagram. It's Jake A. McLaughlin. It's at Jake A. McLaughlin. Yeah, at Jake A. McLaughlin. Um, I'm not on it a ton. I just I'm on it, you know, maybe two minutes a day, if that. Sometimes if you average it out, but uh, that's not the only thing I can think of that you could that you could follow me on um, on there. I probably should be a little bit better about that stuff. It is part of my career, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jake, man, you stay who you are, brother, because uh, you you you're the outdoorsy uh, and and 
I'm in the moment and not like caught up on your phone and all this digital world. And, and so uh, don't ever change. You, even if even if it, it, it makes it difficult to, to get into Zoom meetings and all this other stuff, just be yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I feel like Zoolander when they're like, it's inside the computer, you know, and they're like, those yeah. apes to, like I'm right behind, right in front of them, maybe. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So, Jake, man, thank you so much for spending some time with us and our viewers on Chief Chat. Um, America's Airmen, Soldiers, Guardians now. So, I don't, I'm not sure if you knew that the Space Force are called Guardians. I didn't know that. Go Space yep. Force. Yeah, go Space <laughs> Force. <laughs> Sailors, Marines, and Coast Guard members, man, they all appreciate you. They appreciate your service. Uh, just, you know, just thank you for, like I said, spending some time with us. Uh, you know, I, we, I was looking forward to you, uh, from the last time. And so I was like, uh, yeah, and I think Maurice even texted me. He's like, how did the show go? I was like, yeah, we didn't get the show last time, but we he got them all. Me. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. texted me. I do. I know. I, I really do appreciate it. I, uh, God bless you guys and God bless, you know, all of our troops and our guardians. God bless you guys. Cause it's, uh, yeah, you guys are doing, you guys are doing the right thing. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of everybody. It's just, uh, it's a pretty cool thing. You know, and what you guys are doing is awesome. Really awesome. So we wish you all the best going forward. And uh, we're going to go ahead and close out the show right now. Uh, but if you don't mind hanging on uh, a little bit after the show so we can get some information from you, I'd appreciate it. Of course. Okay, cool. Well, Chief Chat out. See ya. Awesome. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> yeah, I still I, I don't know exactly when we go off. Like I, I hear the music, I hear it stop, 